to conclude the story of Abraham, we only have half of chapter 24 and then chapter 25. We'll take them separately this morning. But first of all, let us pray. Eternal God, we realize that 4,000 years have passed since Abraham walked with you on earth. And yet we know that you have not changed one little bit. And that we may come as he came, and that we may know the great privilege of being your friends through faith. And though many things outside us have changed, our deepest needs inside are the same as his. We need to learn to trust you more and to obey you when you tell us what to do. We need to seek your guidance and allow you to make the decisions that control our life. We ask, therefore, that once again, before ever we begin to praise you, to worship you, to speak to you, that we may listen, realizing how much more important it is that we should listen to what you say than that you should listen to what we say. And yet we thank you that you are going to do that too. And that when we sing and pray together, we are not doing it for each other, much less for ourselves. We are doing it for your sake. Help us then to be utterly real in this hour of worship. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Now Genesis chapter 24, verse 28. You'll remember we're in the middle of a romantic love story and last Sunday morning we left the story where Abraham's servant has found Rebecca and uh, Rebecca has gone home to tell her brother of the exciting happenings at the well that morning. Verse 28, then the maiden ran and told her mother's household about these things and Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban. And Laban ran out to the men to the spring. And when he saw the ring and the bracelets on his sister's arms, and when he heard the words of Rebekah his sister, thus the man spoke to me, he went to the men. And behold, he was standing by the camels at the spring. He said, Come in, O blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside? For I have prepared the house and a place for the camels. So the men came into the house. And Laban ungirded the camels and gave him straw and provender for the camels and water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. Then food was set before him to eat. But he said, I will not eat until I have told my errand. And he said, Speak on. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master and he has become great. He has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, men servants and maid servants, camels and asses. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old, and to him he has given all that he has. My master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I dwell, but you shall go to my father's house and to my kindred and take a wife for my son. I said to my master, perhaps the woman will not follow me. But he said to me, the Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with you and prosper your way. And you shall take a wife for my son from my kindred and from my father's house. Then you will be free from my oath when you come to my kindred. And if they will not give her to you, you will be free from my oath. I came today to the spring and said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now thou wilt prosper the way which I go, behold, I am standing by the spring of water. Let the young woman who comes out to draw, to whom I shall say, Pray give me a little water from your jar to drink, and who will say to me, Drink, and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Before I had done speaking in my heart, behold, Rebecca came out with her water jar on her shoulder, and she went down to the spring and drew. I said to her, Pray, let me drink. And she quickly let down her jar from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will give your camels drink also. So I drank, and she gave the camels drink also. Then I asked her, Whose daughter are you? 
She said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. So I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her arms. Then I bowed my head and worshipped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me by the right way to take the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. Now then, if you will deal loyally and truly with my master, tell me, and if not, tell me, that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. Then Laban and Bethuel answered, The thing comes from the Lord. We cannot speak to you bad or good. Behold, Rebecca is before you. Take her and go, and let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. When Abraham's servant heard the, their words, he bowed himself to the earth before the Lord. And the servant brought forth jewelry of silver and of gold and raiment and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave to her brother and her mother costly ornaments. And he and the men who were with him ate and drank and they spent the night there. When they arose in the morning, he said, send me back to my master. Her brother and her mother said, let the maiden remain with us a while, at least ten days. After that she may go. But he said to them, Do not delay me, since the Lord has prospered my way. Let me go, that I may go to my master. And they said, We will call the maiden, and ask her. And they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? She said, I will go. So they sent away Rebekah their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, O oh, sister, be the mother of thousands of ten thousands, and may your descendants possess the gate of those who hate them. Then Rebekah and her maids arose and rode upon the camels and followed the men, and thus the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Now Isaac had come from Beer la Hiroi and was dwelling in the Negev, and Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there were camels coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she alighted from the camel and said to the servant, Who is the man yonder walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into the tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. The first half of our Bible study this morning, taking the rest of this romantic love story, I want to use to show you the three levels at least at which you can read the Bible. Some people read it quite superficially. I came across a volume in a bookshop some time ago which said, The Bible designed to be read as literature. Well, it wasn't designed for that purpose by God, but men did in that volume. That's one level to read it, and people do read it as an ancient book, as an interesting book, and that's all. I would call this the level of human interest. It's the personal way of reading the Bible simply as a personal story of real lives. The second level is to read it at the devotional level, which means to read it not just for human interest, but for good example, and to ask what lessons you may learn from the people who lived so long ago. Thirdly, there is a deeper level, particularly in this story, of studying it at a theological level and looking for divine patterns. Human interest, that's very shallow, and you don't learn much reading it that way. Good example, you will learn a lot that way. Divine pattern, you'll learn most that way. Now look at this story. If you approach it purely from human interest, there's really not a great deal. You've got to read between the lines to get it. You've got to imagine things that are not told us. You've got to get the feelings. For example, look at Rebecca. Can you imagine her feelings setting off Supposing you set off one day, I'm assuming you're an unmarried young lady with good looks and character, assuming you're setting off to Marks and Spencer's one morning and you meet a man outside Marks and Spencer's who tells you he's been 
searching for you and come a very long way to find you, to take you to be a wife to someone you've never met, I would imagine that your feelings would hardly be calm as you made your way back home afterwards and told your family about it. Rebecca must have been terribly excited, disturbed, even frightened by the whole thing. And she arrived home dripping with jewelry given her by this strange man. In fact, if she'd been properly brought up, she might have been told never to accept such things. But there it is. These were simpler days, less sophisticated days, and days when life was more straightforward. She appears as a, a girl of courage, too, because she decided to accept this man's words at their face value and to go, and to marry an unknown man because she believed she was led of the Lord. But it required courage to go into a strange land, without anybody but her dear old nurse, Deborah, who was to become a faithful family retainer for the next two generations. Or look at Laban from the point of view of human interest. I get the message very clearly that Laban was very impressed with that jewelry. Did you notice that reading between the lines? Her brother, her father must have been dead, her brother is there, and Laban sees all this jewelry, and it's obvious that this impresses him so deeply that he has no more reservations. And in fact, he did fairly well out of it, as we read later. And Laban obviously had an eye to an opportunity. Again, reading between the lines. Or take Isaac, the least interesting of the three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Isaac is a kind of colorless character. It isn't so much what he does as what is done to him that makes him interesting. He's a quiet man meditating in the field. Have you got the picture? a typical child of elderly parents. And I have noticed this and so have you, that when a child is born to parents who are too old to play with that child, the child tends to be a quiet and meditative kind of child. This is the human interest in Isaac, and I could spend a lot of time looking into that more deeply. But at this level of human interest, there's really not much in the story for you this morning. And why should you be interested in people who lived 4,000 years ago? So I'm going to move on to the next deeper level of this story. You see, if you just read the Bible through and look at only the human interest, it's not a book that you'd read again. After all, you've read it once and you know it, you heard it in Sunday school. You wouldn't read it again as an adult if that's all you saw. But now read it at a deeper point of view, the devotional level at which you look for a good example. And in this story, I find three things that stick out like a mile, stick out a mile about these three people, Laban, Rebecca, and Isaac. The first is this. They all three acknowledge the Lord quite freely in their conversation without forcing it, without being pious. They talk about the Lord. Every one and a half inches in my Bible, the Lord is mentioned by one of these three. It's so natural. They just come together and they say, the Lord did this, the Lord has blessed me, the Lord has led me, and this is how God's people talk. They do it naturally, not saying, oh, it's about time I mentioned the Lord again, I've done at least one and a half inches of conversation and I ought to bring him in again. I just pointed that out because it's so regular. People just say the Lord as they might talk about Mrs. Jones or Mr. Smith. It's natural to them. The Lord did this and I did that, he is acknowledged. More than that, they all three submitted to the Lord's control. Instead of making their own decisions as to where they lived, who they married, all three of them not only acknowledged the Lord in their conversation, they submitted to him and allowed him to do with them what they wished. And perhaps the most marvelous example is Rebecca deciding to go within 24 hours of, of meeting this strange man, deciding to go because she said, the Lord is in it, I must go. And then the third lesson is they were all blessed by the Lord because of this. And the word blessing comes in again and again in this chapter that I read. Did you notice it? The two key words are Lord and blessed. The servant was blessed, Laban was blessed, Rebecca was blessed, Isaac was blessed. Now, do you get the message? When you read the Bible at this level, the message becomes absolutely clear. Acknowledge the Lord, allow him to control your life, and you will be blessed. 
But there are far too many people trying to get number three without numbers one and two. And you can't do it. What is the best thing anybody could wish you as you go into the 70s? Good luck, health, wealth. I'll tell you the best wishing, wish that every, anybody could give you. It's this. God bless you. That's far better than health and wealth. I'd rather go into the future unknown as it is, knowing that God was going to bless it, than anything else in the world, wouldn't you? But you cannot know that unless you have numbers one and two in your life. How can God bless a person if they don't acknowledge him and don't let him make the decisions? How can God bless a person who never mentions him, never talks about him, never thinks about him, and decides their own career, their own home, their own marriage, everything themselves. How can he bless? And here's the message. Well, now, you see, we've got much more out of this Bible by reading it at the deeper level. But now let me go to a deeper level still. And here I'm going to dig so deep that I might go a bit too deep for some of you. I hope not. Try and stay with me. It was said of a certain preacher that he... He went, he dived deeper into the truth and came up drier than any other preacher. Well, I hope this is not going to be true at the moment, but we're going deep. We look into this story not only for human interest, which doesn't really yield a great deal. We look into it for good example, which tells us a great deal, but we look into it for divine patterns. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that when God operates, he operates on a certain pattern. Once you've got the pattern, you can learn things at a very deep level. Now, we have already seen that Isaac is a pattern of Jesus. The Bible would say he is a type of Jesus, a pattern. When we saw the beloved son of Abraham carrying the wood which was to be the means of his own death, up the very hill which we later knew as Calvary, we see a pattern in Isaac of Jesus. And at that level, when we read the story of the offering of Isaac, we saw the cross. We saw a pattern of a beloved father ready to give a beloved son in death as a sacrifice. And we saw the pattern which God operated on when he sent Jesus. Now I want to carry that further. If in Isaac you see the divine pattern of Jesus, in Rebekah you can see the divine pattern of the church. Because just as Rebekah was brought to be the bride for Isaac, the church is to be the holy bride of Jesus. Now, if we follow through this divine pattern, we're going to learn tremendous things from this chapter. We see a father, Abraham, who gives us a pattern of God, sending someone to find a bride in whom we see the pattern of the church, for his son Isaac in whom we see the pattern of Jesus, and we ask, therefore, of whom is the servant the pattern? And the answer is twofold. First, the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit himself who has come into the world to capture a bride for Christ. And without the Holy Spirit, Christ would have no bride at all. There would be no church. Nobody would be found and brought to the bridegroom, Jesus, without the Holy Spirit. But that's not the end of the pattern. For the Holy Spirit chooses, since he has no body of his own, to inhabit our bodies which become his temple. And therefore, every Christian listening to my voice this morning is the servant Eliezer. Sent by God the Father out into the world to find a bride for Jesus the Son. And when our young people went out last night into the pubs, coffee bars, and youth clubs of Guildford, looking for people for Christ, they were fulfilling the divine pattern of Eliezer in Genesis 24. They are seeking a bride for the Savior. That's the whole point of evangelism. Now, as soon as you see this, 
this chapter becomes your evangelistic handbook for your task in the 70s. First of all, I point out, for example, that you must not just sit and pray. You've got to go and look. A very simple lesson which we fail to learn. For so often our evangelism says, come. Come to our meetings, come to our services, come to our church. But Abraham said to Eliezer, you go. Go and look. Pray, yes, but go too. And that's the first lesson. Second lesson we shall need to learn is this. We must be guided to the right people. We must ask the Holy Spirit, lead me to someone today. Lead me to the person who needs me. Out of the crowds I'll meet. I think I've told you of the minister who made a New Year's resolution to speak to somebody about Christ every day. A stranger. And one night, shortly after January the 10th, which is when New Year's resolutions are beginning to slip, he was sitting in his study at 10 o'clock at night, and uh, he suddenly realized he hadn't kept his resolution that day. What should he do? It was late at night, the streets were empty. Well, he said, Lord, I'm going out to keep it. And out he went into the streets, and there was a policeman on his beat. Little did that policeman know what was coming. But the minister determined to keep his resolution, a bit like the Boy Scout, you know, determined to take the old lady across the road, even if she didn't want to go, to do his good deed. The minister went up to this policeman and he said, you'll think I'm crazy, but he said, I've just got to talk to you. And he did. And discovered that the policeman was carrying a terribly heavy spiritual burden and was just longing for someone to talk to about it. Now, as Abram said to his servant, an angel will go ahead of you, and prepare the person for you to come and meet and talk to. So when we go out in the name of Christ, we must claim the angels to believe that an angel could go into the youth center before us, to believe that an angel could go into your neighbor's home and prepare the heart of your neighbor. Do you see the divine pattern emerging? I want you to notice how tactful and how delicately the servant spoke to Rebecca. Didn't rush up to her and say, I'm looking for a wife for Isaac, will you come? Just as we are not called to rush straight up to someone and say, are you saved? But Eliezer tactfully, delicately, lovingly opened a conversation and opened it by asking for a favor from the person he was talking to. There is a method of evangelism which we neglect. Christ used it to a woman at the well of Samaria. He said, will you give me a drink? Sometimes the very best thing you could do to open a conversation would be to ask for a favor from someone else. Have you ever tried it? It creates an open door. Well, now, we can learn a lot from there. And I could go on like this, I suppose, all morning, and I don't want to because I want to finish the story of Abraham in chapter 25. But once you've seen the divine pattern, do you see that here is the pattern for our task in the 70s? God the Father has told us, his servants in the Holy Spirit, to go and look for a bride for his son, Jesus. And as we reach out in the 70s, that's what we're doing. We're preparing for a wedding. Two final words about this. One is the constant spiritual telegrams Eliezer sent to heaven. All the time, he keeps praying. And above all, when he has found the girl, he comes back to bless the Lord. There is no greater thrill for any Christian than to lead someone else to Christ. No greater thrill. And I pray that every Christian may know that thrill this year. I want you to know the joy. When you do, come back and bless the Lord and say, Lord, you did it, I didn't. And the other thing about Eliezer is this. The pride and the joy with which he came back all the way to Isaac with the bride whom he had won. There will come a day when you leave your possessions behind, your money behind, your house behind, your career behind. There's one thing I'd love you to have in that day. 
It is to look around the faces of the bride of Christ and see the faces of people whom you brought. That's the greatest wealth that you could have in heaven. To know that as you look around, part of the bride was your work. You brought them to Jesus, the bridegroom. Incidentally, I've just remembered another thing I wanted to say, so I'm going to slip that in too, and then I'll really finish this part. Do you notice that he didn't stop with finding her or getting a decision? He brought her all the way to the marriage. And it is not enough in our task of evangelism to go out and be content with somebody deciding for Christ. That's the beginning of your work, not the end. The rest is the long journey which may be a very long one and a tiring one and an exhausting one of staying with them until they are with Christ, of leading them, of watching over them and of taking care of them for his sake. Not just to find a bride but to bring the bride all the way to the bridegroom. Often that is the harder task in evangelism and in these days when young people are prepared to try anything once, it is comparatively easy, too easy to get decisions for Christ that are shallow and superficial. The harder task is to take them from that decision, however simple it has been, and deepen their relationship and walk with them, helping them to see that they get right through to the full glory that Jesus has for them. A charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, a never dying soul to save and fit it for the sky. Let's sing that hymn. It's number 461. And now the final short chapter that brings Abraham's life to an end. Chapter 25. Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah, and she bore him Zimram, Jokshan, Midan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shuah. Jokshan was the father of Sheba, and Dedan, and the sons of Dedan were Ashurim, Latushim, and Le Leumin. The sons of Midian were Ephah, Ephah, Hanak, Abedar, and Eldar. All these were the children of Keturah. Abraham gave all he had to Isaac. But to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts, and while he was still living, he sent them away from his son Isaac, eastward to the east country. These are the days of the years of Abraham's life, 175 years. Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. Isaac and Ishmael, his sons, buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar, the Hittite, east of Memre, the field which Abraham purchased from the Hittites. There Abraham was buried with Sarah, his wife. After the death of Abraham, God blessed Isaac, his son, and Isaac dwelt at Beer la Roi. These are the descendants of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's maid, bore to Abraham. These are the names of the sons of Ishmael, named in the order of their birth. Nebaioth, the firstborn of Ishmael, and Kedar, Adbiel, Mibsem, Mishmar, Duma, Massa, Hadad, Temar, Jetur, Naphish, and Kedemar. These are the sons of Ishmael. And these are their names by their villages and by their encampments, Twelve princes according to their tribes. These are the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years. He breathed his last and died and was gathered to his kindred. They dwelt from Havilah to Shur, which is opposite Egypt in the direction of Assyria. He settled over against all his people. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac and Isaac was 40 years old when he took to wife Rebekah the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Paddan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah his wife conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is thus, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, 
and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. When her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came forth red, all his body like a hairy mantle, so they called his name Esau. Afterward his brother came forth, and his hand had taken hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was sixty years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And once when Jacob was boiling pottage, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red pottage, for I am famished. Therefore his name was called Edom. Jacob said, First sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. The last chapter in this spiritual giant, Abraham, I've been asking myself all this week, what made Abraham the great man that he was? And I've come to this conclusion. It was the fact that out of the three things that help us to be on the straight and narrow, he had only one. We have example from the past, fellowship in the present, and promises in the future. He had no example in the past, no fellowship in the present, he only had the future. That's what makes him a great man. He had no Bible to read, and you've got a Bible. He had no fellowship of a church that inspired him, you have. He only had the future, and therefore he had to live by faith. And I, when I realized this, I found myself ashamed of myself. I've got a Bible. I've got the encouragement of meeting you every week and seeing saints of God. Do I have as much faith as Abraham has in the future? Am I as sure as he was of things that you can't see? And I've got so much more opportunity. Well now chapter 25 is a kind of population explosion. From one man Abraham comes eight children and 14 grandchildren. Incidentally, he had seven more children than God intended him to have. But this is the population explosion. And in fact, if you just carry those figures on, you are left in no doubt as to why we're in the situation we're in today in the world. This is the kind of curve of population growth. Well, now let's look at Abraham first, verses 1 to 4. I'm sorry, 1 to 11. We know that he had one child by Hagar, Ishmael. He shouldn't have had that child, but he did. We know that he had one child by his own wife, Sarah, Isaac. But now in this chapter we learn that he had six others by a wife called Keturah. And it rather looks as if she wasn't a wife, she was a concubine. I know it looks as if he married her after Sarah's death. But in fact, that isn't implied by the Hebrew. And since she's called a concubine, it's quite clear that he had her before Sarah died. And so he had one child by Hagar, six by Keturah, one by Sarah, simultaneously. And he had deliberately to send the other children away when Isaac came along, we're told that. And here we're left with one of the problems of Abraham's life. Abraham was a polygamist. He had more than one wife. And many people have raised this as a, as a criticism of this great man. Now, I notice that though we're told he had more than one wife at the same time, that this is neither commended nor condemned by God at this stage. And since God doesn't make a comment on it, I think we're wiser not to either. Having said that, it becomes quite clear that God's blessing would only go through the one son that God had intended Abraham to have. 
And therefore Abraham himself recognized this and g gave all that he had to Isaac. Isaac was the heir. He wasn't unfair to the concubines. He gave them gifts. But at least he recognized that uh, God's blessing was going to follow the pattern of one wife. Now just an extenuation of Abraham's actions, may I remind you that though God intended at the very beginning one man to marry one woman, this was very soon forgotten by men. Lamech was the first to have two wives. And therefore by Abraham's day it is highly unlikely that he would know of this. And not until Moses came along was monogamy declared clearly in writing to be God's will. I'm not trying to excuse Abraham, but I think it very doubtful if he knew that this was God's will. But God neither commends him for this nor condemns him. But God makes it quite clear that it is through the child that God intended him to have that the blessing of God will go on. Now Abraham died full of years. I think that's a lovely phrase. It doesn't just mean an old man. It means time well spent. I heard of a man of whom it was said he was dead at 50 and buried at 70. Do you know what I mean by that? He wasn't full of years. He'd had 50 full years and 20 empty ones. And some people have 70 empty years. To live a life that's full of years, that's a wonderful thing, whether it be short or long. It's important that it should be full and that every moment should be spent well. And then he was gathered to his people. Do you know what that means very clearly? It means quite simply that people survive death. It doesn't mean he was buried in the same grave because he wasn't gathered to his people. He was buried with Sarah. Only two of them were buried in Machpelah. He wasn't even taken back to his country Chaldea to be buried. But he was gathered to his people. And the thing I want to tell you now which may be a great comfort to you is this. When you leave your relatives on earth, you can join your relatives in glory. You may leave some behind, but you are gathered to your people in the Lord. And that's a very wonderful comfort. Again, I mentioned the Reverend Cyril Chilvers. A fortnight before his wife died, his former church secretary died, and he had conducted the funeral of his former church secretary. But only a few days before Mrs. Chilvers died in the hospital here, she was chuckling with her husband and saying, I'll see the church secretary before you do. Isn't that lovely? To the world, that's incredible that people should chuckle together about that. But that's Christianity. And Abram was gathered to his people. He joined those who'd gone ahead in the Lord. People don't cease to, so, cease to be when they die. The Bible is crystal clear that we go on beyond death. The body doesn't survive death, but the real person does. And that's an assumption that lies behind the whole teaching of Scripture. That doesn't mean that everybody's future is good. It can mean the opposite, but it does mean that everybody has a future beyond the grave. At the funeral, two sons came together who hadn't seen each other in years. There's something very human about that. At the funeral, the relatives gathered, and there they were. Some families never get together except for funerals. Isn't that a pity? But here were these two who came together, and they saw each other. Two brothers, and they'd lived miles and miles apart, and there they were. And they were at the grave of Abraham. But Abraham was not dead. God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of living. Abraham lived, in fact, to see Jacob and Esau reach their 15th birthday. He saw his grandsons, but Abraham lived to see Jesus born at Bethlehem because Jesus once said, Abraham saw my day and was glad. And that was 2,000 years later. Abraham saw you born because Abraham is alive. And it's this sense of the living We've got to the end of Abraham's story on earth, but it's not the end of Abraham. He's mentioned again and again through the rest of the Bible over the next 2,000 years as a living man. And this is the Christian hope for the future. I know that some have died, but they are not dead. They are alive in the Lord. And they are just the other half of the church, the church triumphant.
as we are the church militant. Now we have a paragraph of Ishmael, twelve sons by an unnamed Egyptian wife. Ishmael lived separate from his brother Isaac and his twelve sons lived separate from each other. But the thing I want you to notice about Ishmael and his sons is this. There is nothing whatever in their story for you. Nothing at all. There is not a single thing from verses 12 to 18 that is of any help to you whatever today, except in a negative way that there is nothing in their lives worth noting. Nothing. They married, they had children, they had built villages, they settled down, they had a job and they died. And that's all you can say about them. And that's all you can say about godless people in the world today. They're born, they marry, they have children, they die. That's all you can say. There's nothing in their life worth noting. There's nothing to say after they're gone. There's nothing that inspires the next generation. What a waste of a human life to live life like that so that all that people can say is born on such and such a date, died on such and such a date. That's all they can put on your stone. What a thing if there's nothing more in your life than that. But that's what it is to be a son of Ishmael, to be born of the flesh and not born of the spirit. And there are lives that are like roundabouts. You get on, you have a great time while you're going round and you get off where you got on and you've lost your money. That's life without God. Meaningless, hopeless, empty, purposeless. If you lost all your money tomorrow, how much would you be worth? If you knew that you were going to die tomorrow, how would you feel about the life you've lived? Worthwhile, useful, fruitful? You can do more in a few years with God than you can do in decades without him of a lasting value. So we leave Ishmael, just history. There is no mention of God in this section, nothing. Why did God put it into the Bible? The answer is very simple, just as a brief warning that life without God is nothing. Nothing. You're just born and die like an animal. There's nothing else to record. You may have built a village. You may have had a career. You may have had children, but there's still nothing to record. Nothing in God's sight that's of value. But now we turn to Isaac. Abraham lived to see his grandsons born to Isaac. And I can imagine Abraham with Jacob and Esau on on his two knees. Can't you see that? Did you ever realize that Abraham knew them both? Perhaps you didn't, because Abraham's death is mentioned before their birth. But if you work out the dates, you'll find he saw them 15 years old. But Isaac had to wait 20 years for his children. There was Ishmael, and every letter he had from Ishmael said, we've got another son. And there was that Egyptian wife who seemed as fertile as anybody. And there was Isaac waiting, waiting. Year came, year went. Twenty years, not a sign. They'd begun to give up hope. In fact, they probably had. But remember that Isaac knew that he had been born in a special way and that his mother had been like this. And so Isaac went down on his knees and he prayed, God, you did it for my mother, you can do it for my wife. This is how faith goes down the generations. When things come hard to your children, praise God. It's when things come easier to your children than to you that you can't pass the faith on. It's when things came easier to me than to my parents that I find it difficult to trust God. And the tragedy is we live in a generation where things have come easy. And young people are paid to do things that formerly they'd have had to work to do. Instead of paying to be an apprentice, they'll get a, a huge grant. And so things come easy to the next generation. Thank God when he makes things difficult for your children. Because it'll drive them to the God you had to go to. And Isaac had a problem here. It didn't come easily. So he got on his knees and he said, Lord, you did it from that generation. Do it in this generation. And faith goes on from generation to generation as each new generation says, Lord, you did it for our fathers, do it again. This is the basis of the prayer for revival. You may feel that in England it doesn't look as if there's going to be a spiritual revival. Humanly speaking, it doesn't. There's no sign of revival in England. But God did do it in the 1850s and he did it in the 1900s. And like Isaac, we could get on our knees and say, Lord, do it again. You did it then. You haven't changed. Do it again. And Isaac said, Lord, do it again. And God did it again. 
and gave him full measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, twins. And that was the answer. Well now, Rebecca was worried about this because they were struggling within her and she thought there was something terribly wrong. And she said, why do I live? There's something wrong. And then God said, there's nothing wrong, it's twins. And they're going to be two nations and the younger one will serve the elder. That's the opposite of the human way of thinking. It's always the other way around in human circles. God has a way of turning our values upside down. The last shall be first, the younger shall be elder. God's knowledge of the future comes out. Now I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the story of the birth and the development of Jacob and Isaac because I want some years ahead, I don't know when, to take you through the life of Jacob as we've gone through Abraham, but not now. Suffice to say that they were not identical twins. That comes out very clearly. One red and hairy, the other doesn't tell us what he was like physically, but what he was like emotionally and mentally, quiet. These two boys, so different. Esau, adventurous, hunter, tough, out-of-door types of father's boy, Jacob, mother's boy. He's cooking in this chapter. He has mother's boy at home, just the opposite. Isn't it strange how out of the same stable you can get two horses so different running the race? And here we have Jacob and Esau, so different from each other. We look at our three children, we think how different they are in temperament argue about who's responsible for the worst side of each temperament. How different they are, the three of them. Jacob and Esau were so different. The point I want to make is this. Of these two grandsons of Abraham, which would the world choose and which would God choose as a blessed life? I'll tell you it's quite clear every time the world has sympathy with Esau. This tough hunter out in the fields, this big hairy ginger head man, this man who goes out and gets it, the man who lives a man's life with his father, that's the man the world admires. But God hated Esau and loved Jacob. Why? There's a very simple reason. It's this. First of all, Jacob had a determination to possess things which once it was directed towards God would make him. He was grasping things from the day of his birth. He was holding on to Esau when he was born and he was holding on to es Esau's birthright when he matured. But there'd come a day when he'd hold on to God and be as determined to hang on to God and get a blessing from God as he was determined to get everything else in life. There was a determination in Jacob to get what he wanted. And once you apply that to God, you're made. And the second thing in Jacob that God loved was this. Jacob was a man who lived for the future rather than the present. Whereas Esau was a man only with an eye to the present opportunity. He was an existentialist, was Esau. He said, it's the now that matters. It's the thrill of today that matters, not the promise of tomorrow, which may never come. Pie in the sky when you die, would, have, would Esau have said, mocking Jacob, but Jacob said, I want a birthright then. Esau in the Bible is described as a profane man, a man who is so profane that he grasps a plate of soup now rather than some vague blessing in the future. He's the man who says, I'm not interested in heaven, I'm only interested in my pay packet this week. I'm not interested in what life's going to be like when I'm 50, I want a good time now. That's Esau, and God hates Esau, and he loves Jacob. Jacob, with all his faults, with all his flabbiness, with all his weak points, which are all there, was yet a man who said, I'm going to see to the future, and I'm going to grasp it with every opportunity I have. And so he made a takeover bid for Esau's birthright, and he got it. And many descendants of Jacob have been involved in takeover bids ever since. But when that is directed to God instead of just to money or to business, then that quality makes a man supreme. This is, in a sense, the height and the depth of the whole nation of Israel named after Jacob, 
that when they give their gifts that grasping opportunism to money, they go right to the head of the tree. They're at the top of almost every profession. You name it, you'll find a Jew at the head of it. But when that quality is devoted to God, and a Jew says of God, this one thing I do as St. Paul did, my, what can happen then? All that determination, that living for the future which is inherent in them, makes them men of God. So Jacob died full of years and of old age, and he lived to see two grandsons. At first sight, one of them looked like a real man to continue the line, but God said no. It's the second one, the younger one, that's going to keep the blessing, that will go on living as you have lived. And there would come a day when Jacob himself wrestled with God and said, God, I'm finished with the other things I grasped. I want you now. And I'm going to hang on to you until you bless me. And God said, I bless you. And I give you another name. I'm going to call you Israel. And from now on, you will be the father of the nation. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob is the God we're going to worship when the children join us now. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we think of all Abraham's sons. We realize that only one of them continued, and his grandsons, only one continued in his faith. Less than 10%. We realize that in the world today, less than 10% acknowledge you as God. But we thank you that in Jacob and in those who followed him, there were enough for you to fulfill your whole purpose for the world. And we thank you that today there are just enough for you to continue your purpose. We ask that each one of us may learn to walk in faith as Abraham did, as Isaac did, as Jacob did. We pray too that during the 70s you will send us out as Abraham sent Eliezer out to be your servant in the world to bring the bride to Jesus and to win others for his name's sake. Amen.